What's your dream life? What does that look like? What's the car you drive? What's the house? Where do you live? How many times do you go away? And work out how much on a monthly basis that dream life is going to cost you. And that's your number. Once you have the number, you can reverse engineer the actionable steps that you need to get there. But yeah. we've found an immense amount of value from courses and also now actually having a mentor. The amount of actual value that we've gained and mm -hmm. things that we've instantly implemented into our business and like lessons that we've learned it, it, have been genuinely priceless and probably would have taken us a long, long time to figure those things out without. Yeah. We, we feel like we have to figure everything out ourselves, right? We have this big pride in front of us it's like no i don't want to listen to anybody else because top g said put your head in your laptop and just go to work right but that's not actually the reality of how people win people win with other people it, i know it's a side topic and away from what we were talking about but like yeah. always have those open ears and, uh -huh. and, and be available to learn yeah. from whoever it is going and investing in a mentor or in a course isn't going to fix all your problems they'll give you the tools they'll tell you how to use them but they're not going to use them for you you still have to go and do the work you can't create a product and just put it into the market the market actually needs to want your product. It, th th there needs to be room for your product in the specific market that you're going into. I mean, you've got 100% chance of failing all the shots you don't take. We wasted time and money on this when we could have spent that time in so much, in, in way more valuable ways. Mm -hmm. But in the early stages of your business, again, something that I wish we knew sooner, something that I wish we could have implemented sooner was Hey guys, welcome back to the Goons Podcast. Today, me and Chris sat down and we spoke about five things that we wish that we learned sooner along our business journey. If you're new to business or you're just like me and Chris and you're two, three years along your business journey, then this is an episode for you. Thank you for all the support on the podcast, guys. We are closing in on 2,000 subscribers and it's a goal of mine and Chris's to hit that. So make sure that you hit the subscribe button and enjoy the episode. What's the first thing that you wish that we knew and implemented sooner into our business, bro? It's probably something that a lot of people wouldn't think of, mm. but having an actual space to work that's not an office at home with you know family members or whether that be a partner or kids running around. I mean, we don't have kids, but having an actual place of work that you go to every single day where ideas can flow. Yeah. Uh, you, obviously, having a business partner is a little bit different at home. You could maybe set yourself up to win in those environments and could be a little bit different or grab your laptop like you said to me earlier and go to a cafe when we were brainstorming about the episode. But I still think having like a solid place to work is, is pretty important, man. Somewhere yeah. that you come. And I feel like one of the biggest benefits that we've learned from it is like leaving the office is kind of more so of a switch off, if that makes mm -hmm. sense. A little bit different if things are going on. I don't know if a deal has to be done uh, yeah. middle of working on something for a client. It's a yeah. little bit different. But having an actual place of work is such a big, big factor, man, to... Making progression, I think some of our best ideas have come out of it. And mm -hmm. also that that balance. I think balance is the key word, mm. it is, isn't it? Because it, when we leave from here, it's like, okay. Mm -hmm. But whereas beforehand, I mean, in the first year and a half of, of running our business, yes, we don't have each other to bounce ideas off of, but it's like you can leave the desk at whatever time of the day, but the desk is only mm -hmm. a walk away at all times. Mm -hmm. Or that notification comes through, can you do X, Y, and Z, which... When it's there, you feel obliged to go and to, to do that, right? So mm -hmm. it's not only making us more efficient at work, I think, but it's also as well, like, making us more efficient at home. Mm -hmm. A big part of, like, having the office space is it gives us an opportunity to spend quality time with the people that matter mm -hmm. at home, building our relationships with our families, with our siblings, with our partners, whatever that may look like, whatever that may be. Having a dedicated workspace is when I'm here, I'm at work. Mm -hmm. End of. You can't really reach me unless you need to. Mm -hmm. And then when I'm back, like, yeah, Chris is here. Mm -hmm. H is here. H is home, right? Not H, the businessman that's trying to run a business, is just working out of home. Mm -hmm. Like, you're home as you, yeah, you yeah. know? I think I, I, I genuinely do think that some of our best ideas have come out of working in the 100%. office. 100%. And the thing is, is like someone that's running a business on their own. They might be like, oh, I don't need space. I can work from home. There's literally someone in our building that runs, well, he's in the marketing space as well, and he's just got a one-man office. Yeah. Like, for the same reasons of balance, I can't concentrate at home with the kids, with my partner, et cetera. Mm -hmm. And, like, it's probably a little bit more streamlined for him to work than just waking up and, like, strolling over to your desk in the corner, yeah. et cetera. I think routine's a big one as well mm -hmm. with that. Like, it's a lot easier to set boundaries with yourself in regards to routine, right? 
Because when you're at home, it's very easy to have a prolonged lunch break mm -hmm. because you're only at home. I'm, I'm, I'm sitting on this table and now I'm sitting on that table. But if you've got an office to come back to, if in our situation as well, we've got each other to come back to, it's like, okay, go home, eat, do what I need to do, and I'm coming back, and, and it's time to go. Mm -hmm. Do you know what I'm saying? Like that routine side of things as well, like uh, maybe not being regimented, but like it allows you to kind of set mm -hmm. the boundaries of, okay, well, I need to be here at this time. I'm going to go to eat or order in around this time, and I'm not going to leave until stuff's done, but like we're gonna leave at this time. Mm -hmm. You know what I'm you know what I'm saying? I just think, yeah. For me it's one it's one of one of the five that we're gonna talk about today that I just wish we made the jump sooner. Mm -hmm. I think a lot of it for us was like we don't need it. It's another expense that we don't need. But to anybody out there that's listening that is def like that is definitely if you're in a partnership, get get around each other as much as you can. Mm -hmm. Like H mentioned earlier ideas just in general being with each other all the time a case of like needing to sign off on things bro you cool with this blah, blah, blah. as opposed to calling him but he's on another call or do you know what i'm saying like chasing our asses like by the time that we actually get a yes or a no that deal might have come might have gone mm -hmm. or whatever the case you know that's a bit extreme but mm -hmm. you get what i'm saying yeah um so yeah man i think that's a big one what's the second thing um the second one for me, I mean, I, I kind of I had to fight for this one. I think I think this one maybe means a little bit more to me, maybe because of the way that I work as opposed to, to H. But setting yourself a clear and specific goal that you can reverse engineer from. Like, especially when we started out, it was what do you want? I want financial freedom. I want time freedom. I want location freedom. But what does that actually look like? What's the number where you have financial freedom? What's the amount of time that you have to spend in your job to classify it as time freedom? How often are you traveling to be location free or what, whatever that may be, right? It's, it's a lot of people are very, very broad when people ask them, what do you want? Um, and that kind of leave things, leaves things up to kind of chance, in my opinion. But if you have a set specific goal and one thing, an exercise that I got put through on a course that I went on was just, and it changed my perspective. It was like, what's your dream life? What does that look like? What's the car you drive? What's the house? Where do you live? How many times do you go away? And work out how much on a monthly basis that dream life is going to cost you. And that's your number. Once you have the number, you can reverse engineer the actionable steps that you need to get there. And I think it's so important in business as opposed to just saying, what do you want to do with the business? Oh, we want to make 100 million. Mm -hmm. But everything that we might want to achieve might be attainable at 2 million. How much more motivated are we going to be when we're going and taking the actionable steps to get to 2 million because we're actually ticking some things off. Mm -hmm. But to get to 100 million is a lot harder than it is to get to 2 million, you know? So like, yeah, set yourselves like clear and specific goals. I feel like for me, it's something that massively helps me. Um, seeing that goal, reverse engineering, setting actionable steps in place that you can go along your journey and tick off, um, not only for motivational purposes, but also as well so that you can see whether you're on track, whether you're behind, are you ahead? Are you, do you know what I'm saying? Like you can actually track, like when we run a campaign for somebody, if we didn't track any of the metrics, we wouldn't have anything to go off of. Mm -hmm. We wouldn't have any data. We wouldn't know when we need to change this creative or change this copy because it's not working. Mm -hmm. So if we don't have actionable steps and goals in regards to what we want to achieve, how can we correct certain things mm -hmm. if we don't have the data, right? Mm -hmm. So it's really, really important, man. I think it's really, really important for me individually. Um, I think it's massively important. Set yourself the goal and, and be specific. I want to take X amount of trips. I want to fly business or, or, or first. I want to earn 25K profit into my personal account. Like whatever those numbers, whatever those things are, write them down, be specific, and then reverse engineer from them the actionable steps that you need to achieve them. The example that I, I just thought of whilst you were speaking was like, for instance, uh, marathon prep. Mm -hmm. End goal is quite clearly there, and obviously sessions are set out in a plan. Obviously, if you follow an instruction plan, but yep. those those actionable steps are there on paper mm -hmm. in front mm -hmm. of you, which you follow, which leads you to the end goal. And yep. without doing every single one, you're then unprepared. Yeah, it can why apply to so much stuff, mm -hmm. bro. That's why it's important not to 
like not to miss one one rep, whether that's in business, wh- mm-hmm. wh- whatever it may be, one rep, one session, one one piece of work, whatever that may be. Yeah, it's important. There's so many ways that you can that, you, that, that, that there's so many different things that this can apply to, and it doesn't have to just be business, right? It can be very very simple. You use the the marathon in uh, in that kind of space. I want to get abs. Abs is the goal, right? But then you once you have the goal, you can reverse engineer what it takes to get the abs. Look at other people that have abs. How many times do they do cardio? What foods are they eating? Do you know what I mean? What types of workouts are they doing? You can reverse engineer from the end goal, the actionable steps that you need to take. It can apply to everything and anything. And without that goal set in place, you, 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 you're shooting blanks, right? You're swinging at a target that you don't know where it is. <laughs> You don't know what you're swinging at. Or you're swinging at 100 million targets when really you need to focus on one target. And then once you achieve that one target, you can focus on to the next one and the next one. And eventually you'll hit all 100. But the order in which you do them is going to be dependent on what step it is. Do you know what I mean? What? But yeah. So it, it, for me, that's really, really important. And that's something that especially at the start of our journey, I think we would have benefited massively from. Mm-hmm. In business, in personal terms, what do we want to be as people? What does that look like? Mm-hmm. And reverse engineer from it. Liam said it last week. If we look at all of the biggest companies in the world that we aspire to be like, and we reverse engineer how they got there, the example he used was risk and sacrifice. If you can reverse engineer from the companies we aspire to be like, I don't think there's any of them that have achieved what they've achieved without big amounts of risk and sacrifice. You can apply it to so much stuff, man. So it's really important. Set that specific goal and then reverse engineer from there the actionable steps that you need to take to achieve it. Vamos! Love that, Sean. <laughs> What's next, bro? The, the, the third one, I feel like this one's quite important. I feel like I'm quite good at this as well. I, I feel like it's something that I never really realized. Um, but not chasing perfection. Mm. I feel like I'm, from my perspective, I don't know, just put things out and just kind of... You, you're you're going to get better results from repeatedly putting whatever it is out to the universe yeah. than trying to make one thing perfect. Mm-hmm over a longer period of time for, for instance the best way that i can put it is the example that i gave you earlier for instance let's say a landing page if someone if a business came to us and they were like i want you to make the perfect landing page um you've got a month to do it we'd probably make like a bang average landing page but if a if a if a company came to us and was like i want you to make 30 landing pages we'd probably end up making a much better landing page than the the one that we were supposed to make perfect because we're going to be getting the reps in and we're going to be getting the practice mm-hmm. so it's like just do things. I mean, something as well, even that you've said is like in the past, just in the office, like for instance, if we're going back and forth about something, for instance, it, it, it happened the other day. It was like just, like, just put it out. We could make the changes after, mm-hmm. which is what we did with a client recently. Like yeah. it's so important. Yeah. I mean, you, you've got 100% chance of failing all the shots you don't take. Mm. It, it, do you know what I mean? You, you are 100% certain to not achieve your goal when you put nothing out, chasing mm-hmm. the perfection. But that's not the case if you put 10 or mm-hmm. 15 or 20 things out that, in your opinion, might be crappy. Mm-hmm. It's not, it, you, listen, you might not achieve what you want to achieve straight away, but like you said, the lessons that you learn in building out these things, in putting them out, in getting the feedback, are going to be the things that make you the right person like, mm-hmm. to, to, to actually achieve that goal. I mean, even... Another example we can use is the podcast. Mm -hmm. Episode one to 10 of the podcast was far from perfect. But 11 was much better than one. Mm -hmm. But if we skipped one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, 10, and just tried to make the perfect one on 11. If we tried to make the perfect podcast, we'd still be there trying to make it today. Well, yeah. Yeah. Do you know what I'm saying? So it's more important just to get the reps in. I mean, I, 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 I can be sometimes our biggest critic with the podcast, right? And I can say that our first 25 episodes, maybe not the conversation. I don't think the conversation was ever anything that was like terrible. Mm-hmm. But like in regards to the way that we're setting things up, how the audio is, consistency of set and all of these kind of things, like message that's being portrayed, thumbnail styles, title styles. Mm-hmm. Like there was no real identity, but... And it wasn't perfect. And even now, it's not perfect. But it's taken 94 episodes, now 95 episodes, for us to kind of find our identity, Mm -hmm. to kind of find our niche. And I don't think it's a coincidence that it's about now that 
you guys are starting to catch on and you're starting to listen on a more regular basis. But it's taken us 95 fucking weeks. <laughs> Do you know what I mean? But those 95 weeks of imperfection might be the reason that when these people start to catch on and start to be like, you know what, I actually like the way that these guys talk on a podcast. I like the guests that they get on. I like the set. I like the audio. It's crisp. The, the, the videos are crisp, etc. That might not have even been possible if we were trying to get it off first time. Yeah. Of so course. Exactly the way that I said it, man. It's important just to get the reps in. Just, get just out. start doing, yeah. Yeah, just get just get it out there, man. Nothing is going to be perfect, and if you chase the perfection, you'll just find yourself going round and round and round in circles. And the end outcome of that is the exact same outcome that you are at when you start. Mm. It's the exact same. At least putting something out that's crappy, you're going to at least learn something. Mm -hmm. You're going to take some kind of feedback, whatever it may be, right? Mm -hmm. Obviously, we we spoken about the podcast. It could be for a landing page. It could be running an ad campaign, trying to set up a perfect ad campaign or trying to release a product. The first product might not be the product that makes you a millionaire mm. or the first drop shipping store might not be the first one, but you might learn all the lessons that you can take into two, three and four, which do make you a millionaire or do make you achieve the dreams. But if you didn't start in the first place because you were chasing the perfection, you won't give yourself the opportunity to even be there. So mm. yeah, man, that's a big one. It doesn't mean go and put out absolute trash though. To the universe That's of course of well. course like, still be proud to what you're yeah. doing to an extent but just jump right mm -hmm. just yeah. do it it's important just do it and have some cojones yeah facts mm. throw yourself in the deep end man and keep yourself afloat mm. you'll learn a you lot more all... trying to keep yourself up than you will if you don't jump you can always just make the changes after mm -hmm. i mean it, the only advice that i could give to someone with a product-based business is don't order a shitload yeah. Product, to be fair like maybe think that one through yeah but in terms of like online business like the way that it's relatable is you can change something whatever. yeah yeah 100 percent. what's the next one bro the next one there, there was an argument for this one to be the top but the the last point that we're going to get onto is the most important one so yeah. make sure that you do actually stay around for that yeah because we learned this skill from number four mm -hmm. and that is having in, investing in a mentor or some form of education mm -hmm. I don't think that it is necessarily something that's essential, but yeah. we found a, an immense amount of value yeah. from uh, courses and also now actually having a mentor. I mean, it's only been three weeks with a mentor, but the, the amount of actual value that we've gained and mm -hmm. things that we've instantly implemented into our business and like learnt uh, in, in terms of the lesson lessons that we've learned it, it have been genuinely priceless and probably would have taken us a long, long time to figure those things out without yeah. I think one big problem, especially with nowadays with the, the young entrepreneur, especially us men, we, we feel like we have to figure everything out ourselves, right? We have this big pride in front of us. It's like, no, I don't want to listen to anybody else because Top G said, put your head in your laptop and just go to work, right? But that's not actually the reality of how people win. People win with other people. And the, the, the saying, your, your net worth is your network. It's not possible without other people, with other people's knowledge, um, other people that have been through experiences that you haven't yet been through. Open that door, don't open that one, because I've opened it, and it's horrible, you know? <laughs> like, there's, there's so much power in taking value from somebody that's already been through the processes and the steps that you're going through, and taking information from them, right? I mean, obviously, not just taking it from them, you're trying to add some value back as well, mm. but in, in our case, it's taking it. Mm -hmm. The value we exchange back is money. It's financial. Mm -hmm. But already we can see a return on our investment or a possible return on our investment in the space of three weeks because the person that we're, we're, we're kind of, we've, we're dropping our pride, we're dropping our ego and we're asking the questions. Be eager to learn because there's always somebody that's going to be better at something than you out there, regardless of however good you are at a certain, a certain skill or uh, whatever it may be. There's somebody that's better. So you can always be open to learn. And knowledge is power, man. Mm. Knowledge is power. I think why that's such an, an important thing, obviously, knowledge. You can go and gain knowledge from anybody. It's e even a, a little bit swaying away from this main topic now. But even like you, you might meet somebody and think that they're the most stupid person that you could possibly meet. This is a waste of time. I'm not mm -hmm. learning anything from this person. But like regardless, like there's always still a lesson to be learned. Yeah. Like it's why it's important to listen. Like for instance, if I was sat across now to a really stupid person that I thought in my head, no, some of those thoughts, what am I doing here? I'm wasting my time. The lesson learned is I don't want to be like that person. Like mm -hmm. simple as like there's still 
it, I know it's a side topic and away from what we were talking about, but like yeah. always have those open ears and, uh-huh. and, and be available to learn yeah. from whoever it is. Yeah. What, one thing that one of our, our guests actually said as well, which I think is really, really important when choosing or uh, picking a mentor to go with and to invest into is don't go and pay a mentor that is 100 steps ahead of you. If you are just starting out in business and you feel like you need guidance, do not go and invest into somebody that's already doing 100K per month because the next actionable steps for you that you need help with, they're they're, they're just way too advanced. They're on a different level to you. You have to be realistic with it. They went through those doors two years ago. Whereas Three years someone, ago, 10 years ago. Whereas well, someone yeah. doing maybe five or 10,000 more than you, like depending on like <laughs> the, the, the size of your business, obviously. Yeah. Um, for instance, he's gone through, the, through those doors mm-hmm. last month Yeah, and he can advise you on them. Yeah. So go with somebody that's not that far out of reach, right? Mm-hmm. You want to look for somebody as a mentor. You want to look for somebody that, yes, is slightly ahead of you. Of course, because you need to learn from them. But somebody that's not leaps and bounds ahead of you so that they can actually relate to your situation. And you made a valid point. The guy at 100K may have been at your situation two years ago or three years ago or four years ago. In the online space, a lot can change in two, three, four years. Mm. I mean, two years ago, bro, ChatGBT wasn't even accessible to as many people as it is now. It probably was, but not as many people knew about it. Right? And from when, like, three no, years ago yeah, then, yeah. four years, well, whatever it may be. Mm-hmm. But even now, the advancement of AI, with AI chatbots being a normal thing on people's website. Two years ago, that wasn't even a, do you know mm-hmm. what I'm saying? Like, there's so much stuff that move and change so that when that person actually went through the, the barrier that, that you're trying to break down, you're trying to, to overcome, times were very different. The technique that they may have used at that time to overcome it may be a completely different technique that you need to use now to overcome it. So that's another reason as to why getting somebody that maybe one or two or three or even five steps ahead of you in your position right now on those actionable steps that we spoke about before, when you reverse engineer from the goal, that's the person that you need to invest your time into because they're going to be able to help you and it's going to be fresh. And as well, more often than not, they're probably going to be a little bit cheaper, right? (laughs) We don't want to break the bank straight away. Like, don't go and pay 10K for a course that you can't afford because it's not going to change your life. Mm -hmm. The the harsh reality is that you still have to do the work. And going and investing in a mentor or in a course isn't going to fix all your problems. They'll give you the tools. They'll tell you how to use them, but they're not going to use them for you. Mm -hmm. You still have to go and do the work. So it's not a get-rich-quick, quick-fix scheme investing into somebody. It needs to be a decision that you make, that you and your business partner make, or you and your team make as a collective We're going to invest X amount into our education and we're going to take as much out of it as possible and we're going to action every single step that they kind of give us. We're going to put faith into this person and the information they're providing us and let's go to work. Mm -hmm. And if you don't, it won't work. Mm -hmm. Just end up literally throwing money down the drain. Yeah, the main thing is that you do have to genuinely be prepared to put in the work. Mm -hmm. I mean, you, you kind of teased us with the last one, bro, beforehand. I mean, what what has our mentor and the courses that we've kind of taken on taught us? I mean, it's probably the most important lesson that we've taken, it, right? It's something that we probably should have understood from the start, really. But mm-hmm. it, maybe it's naivety coming into, like, business. 100%, I think it is. Um, but understanding that you can't create a product and just put it into the market. The market actually needs to want your product. There needs to be room for your product in the specific market that you're going into. Mm -hmm. So like, what good is it for us, for instance, if people want more customers and we design a system, I don't know, if we design a customer help center, for I I know that it's completely different, but what good is our product if people want more customers? No, they want to run ads or they want to create a funnel through social media or cold outbound, for instance. Mm -hmm. The, The market has to literally want what you're creating. So, one thing that obviously that we're doing at the moment is we're actually going and we're doing cold outreach, speaking to business owners from different niches mm-hmm. to actually understand what their problems are and how we can solve them. Yeah. And if we can as well. Yeah. We don't want to be looking at the wrong niche. We're trying to create the, the, the best way to look at it is we're trying to create a product around the market. You have to create mm-hmm. your product around the market, right? Again, this is another thing out of a course that we've invested um, time and money into. but And our mentor as well. Well, yeah, of course, mm. yeah. But if if you are trying to sell a product 
to a market that doesn't want or need it, you're not going to sell <laughs> very many. Mm. And if you do sell one, by chance you're a gr- you have a great sales team and you've made up some fucking fake credibility or whatever it is to get someone over the line, they're going to very quickly realize that you're not moving the needle for them. It's not actually making an impact on their business in a positive way and they're going to leave. You're going to have a high churn. So like H said, man, you go and do your market research. Make sure that your product or service that you're trying to sell, first of all, solve somebody's problem. If you can solve somebody's problem, you can be a solution to their problem or to their pain point, then you can ask for some money in return. But until you know that you can do that, <laughs> you're not going to go very far, man. You're not, you're not going to achieve anything. You're not going to sell to anybody because you're not fixing the problem. Right. Well, the, the, the main question that people are probably wondering as well, the main thing that people are probably wondering is like, how do I find out what the product needs? And it's exactly what I said that we're doing. Mm-hmm. You need to speak to people, whether that is if you're creating a product for, I don't know, for instance, dog owners. Mm-hmm. Go and speak to 100, 200 dog owners. Go, go email them, DM them on Instagram, go out in the street. You see someone speak to a dog owner. For instance, in our scenario, we're trying to find B2B businesses. Mm-hmm. So what are we doing? We're outreaching to businesses to get them on a call and speak with them just about their market research. Some of them don't want to, some of them do. But we're trying to figure out these problems, mm-hmm. document them, and then trying to solve their problems that they actually have rather than creating a solution to a problem that actually doesn't exist. Mm-hmm. I like your example of the dogs and we can roll with it. If, you, if you're trying to sell uh, a leash that's invisible, I don't know, stupid. Yeah. But if you spoke to 100 dog owners and you said, oh yeah, how's your leash? Is it good? Yeah, it's right. Mm-hmm. Strong? Yeah. Does it smell? No. Does it go around your dog's neck nicely? Yeah. Does it hold them at the distance that you want to hold them? Yeah. Would it benefit you if it was invisible? No. Why, why, why would I want an invisible? Straight away, mm-hmm. your, your product is never going to work. So, yeah, it's not wanted. It's never going to work because the market doesn't need it, right? And it's, it's hard nowadays to find products that are needed, let's say, that aren't already invented. But, or, or services that aren't already invented, but you don't have to go and invent one. Do you know what I mean? Just go and, go and imitate one. Make, put your own spin on it. What, can, can you add a USP? Look at something that's already solving multiple problems in the industry that you're trying to tap into and try and get a piece of that pie, man. So much money in the world. Mm-hmm. There's so many people in the world that need their problems or their pain points resolved, right? And if you can be... If you can position yourself in between that problem and, and that end goal, let's say, and you're the kind of the thing that, that, that gets it, that, 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 I mean, that sounds so basic the way I've just said it, but you're, you're the person, you're you, the product, you're the service that you can come up fix. You the solution. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Then you're going to, it's going to work, right? Mm-hmm. I mean, it's not that simple, but <laughs> you've got better chance than if it's not going to fix anybody's yeah. problems, right? Yeah, then there's product market fit. Yeah, exactly that. So that's, that's the most important thing, I think, for any business, right? Mm-hmm. Your product or your service has to solve a problem for whoever it is that you're trying to sell it to. Liam said it again last week. I hate to keep going back to his episode, but a very, very knowledgeable guy, and it was a, a great episode. He's done very, very well for himself. Um, but again, he, he used the example. If we look at the top businesses around the world, what problem, what, which one of them doesn't solve any problems? If a business isn't solving somebody's problem or finding a solution to somebody's pain point, no one's going to buy it. Mm-hmm. So you, you just have to look at the guys that you're trying to be like and, again, reverse engineer it. What problems are they solving? Can I solve a similar problem? Or can I identify a new problem and be the solution to that? Because you can't, you can't sell a business. You can't sell a product that's not wanted or needed. Mm-hmm. So that's why the product or the service is the most important thing. So, yeah. I wish we'd have known that from early because we were kind of just putting out a product, trying to sell a product that we thought people needed Mm -hmm. when really it was something that they maybe wanted. The guys that actually paid us at the time were guys that wanted it, not necessarily needed it. And I think it shows in the progression that we made over the time that we made (laughs) that we didn't put enough effort and time into creating our product. But you live and you learn. There was one that didn't make the cut that I think you should touch on because... There's some people that it might apply to and there's some people that it won't. You need to remind me. 
about um, out, outbound, right? About about ads. Oh yeah. I mean, do you want to just quickly touch on it before we wrap up? Yeah, because it mean, is something yeah, that will apply to yeah, a lot of guys. It's something which, again, from courses, mentors, people that we've spoken to, again, has kind of taught us. Running paid ads, and this is somewhere that we kind of failed, like trying to create a funnel through paid ads when you haven't maxed out your your cold outbound or cold inbound, um, yeah, inbound through organic, etc. When you haven't mastered that and you've got no leads coming in that way, then don't run paid ads. Like paid ads are the last thing that you run, without mm-hmm. a doubt. That's what everybody said, and like we've wasted so much money doing it, so much time doing mm-hmm. it, trying to build, again, perfect landing page, goes back to... Perfect ad creatives. Yes. Yeah, that stuff can wait. Like you, you could, you can do things that are going to be way, way more cost effective to actually scale your business further. Mm-hmm. I think ads are like a quick fix, right? I, I, I feel like w- with running, with running paid ads, we kind of, we again, we didn't make a product that the market. Well, we didn't know whether the market wanted it or mm-hmm. not, and we tried to put this product out to the ether without any real results. We didn't try anything organic to see if people even wanted it, and we wasted a shitload of money and got like smaller results. We, we, we got relatively small results. I mean, some yeah. of the clients we are working with today from our ads, which, I mean, great. Yeah. There is a return on our investment, but still, we wasted time and money on this when we could have spent that time in so much, in, in way more valuable ways. Mm-hmm. Also, this, is, this isn't to say that paid ads don't work, right? This is just to say, don't go and do basically what we did. The first, the first kind of step, once we're like, new product, new niche, Ads, let's hammer it. As long as our ads look like Alex or Moses, they'll work. We'll, we'll be the, all right. Well, well the thing is, is, I had this conversation. With, so I'm almost like consulting someone at the moment. Just mm-hmm. it's, it's a friend of mine. I helped him at the start of his business. He reached out for some more help. I was like, I'd happily consult you. Like, would be some good experience for me, etc. Side note, um, a mentor that is one or two steps ahead. Mm-hmm. Yeah, exactly. There you go. Wish I was getting paid for it. Not, I wouldn't <laughs> charge him anyways, but we're good <laughs> for some paying clients. But... um he, he was like, oh, what do you think about paid ads, man? I know that you, you, you do them. It's a service that you offer. Like, shall I start running paid ads? I was like, well, no. Like, obviously, what we've been told is the last thing. I was like, with paid ads, you're putting a pound into a machine and you're hoping to get two back. Mm-hmm. I was like, it, and he was like, oh, okay, it's kind of like gambling. I was like, do you know what? I've never even looked at it like that. But to an extent, it is. You're going to spend all this time building out a funnel, all of these different strategies, landing page, etc., to hopefully get... Put, to hopefully put a pound in machine and get two out. I said to him, I was like, you've got 9,000 followers there that are following you because of your content. Go and DM them. Mm-hmm. Like, go and DM 100 of them. You're probably going to find someone that wants your services. Like, and that is completely free compared to taking a risk financially yeah. with 1,000 pounds, 1,500, kitting out a mm-hmm. whole system that's not guaranteeing a result. Yeah. But it's not just like gambling. Because there is a strategy behind of ads, course, of, right? Of course, if you, if you have a tried and tested product, you have credibility, you have testimonials from previous clients or existing clients, you know the market is in demand for what it is that you're selling, then ads are great. But in the early stages of your business, again, something that I wish we knew sooner, something that I wish we could have implemented sooner was don't just look for the quick fix before you know that your product works, that your market needs your product and that you've got some kind of case studies to sell off the back of because you need confidence as well when, you sell, when, you, when you're selling, you need to be confident in your product. So even if you ran a really, really successful ad campaign, you had loads of leads come through, how many of them are you gonna convert when they ask, oh yeah, so how many results have you got? Uh, are you gonna start off your business relationship on a lie? I wouldn't recommend it, mm-hmm. do you know what I mean? And then what's the close rate gonna be when you say, well, we haven't actually tried any of this yet. Here's the invoice, two and a half thousand. Mm-hmm. It doesn't really work like that, you know? So like you mentioned, you did touch on it briefly. It's the last step. Mm-hmm. Try all the I've, organic I've, stuff I've, first. I feel, like, I feel like when you don't have money to, an, like I know that it isn't literally gambling, but mm-hmm. when you don't have money to an extent it is because you look at someone like Hormozy or for instance, Charlie Morgan, he, he's got a great funnel, it's great ads. Yeah. He, um, he's got money to spend and to fail and to not be perfect. To test. Whereas if you're working with a small budget, you kind of have to be perfect the first time, which mm-hmm. you are leaving to chance. 
because you don't know because you're putting things out for the sake of it to hopefully get that result. But you've used two examples, mm -hmm. Alex Hormozzi and Charlie Morgan, who both have a great product, mm -hmm. who both know the market are in huge demand for what they're awesome. selling, who have loads of credibility and testimonials. So yeah, they've got a big pile of money, but why? Because they have the other three. Mm -hmm. So what, then uh, they can afford uh, to do the paid ads, right? And another thing, what did they do first? Hormozzi, organic content. Mm -hmm. Charlie Morgan, again, organic content. Mm -hmm. Organic, inbound, cool. outbound. Yeah. So, yeah, I mean, we said we were going to give you five. I pr we pretty much gave you six. So, I mean, the last one is more specific towards kind of like... It's like an honorable mention. Yeah, mm -hmm. it's in there, but it doesn't necessarily apply to everybody. Whereas I feel like the first five that we've given can apply to everybody, right? Mm -hmm. So just to go through, the first one was a dedicated office space, right? The second one was... A clear specific. I was, I was, I was, wait, I was waiting for you to, <laughs> to come back. <laughs> the third one is fail forwards, right? It don't, it don't chase perfection because you'll never find it. The fourth one, invest into your education. Find a mentor that's not 100 million steps ahead of you, but maybe one or two, right? And even if it's not a mentor, invest in your education in books, in YouTube, right? Invest your time into learning more about your craft and what you're selling. And finally, make sure that your product is fucking solid. Because that is the be all and the end all. If your product is shit, you will not have any success in business. And I can stand by that 100 million percent. So, yeah, it's been a pleasure. It's been a pleasure, brother. Thank you all for clicking on this video, for watching, for listening. Make sure you like, comment, subscribe, turn the bell notification on so you get notified every time we release a podcast. And we'll see you all next week. Love, guys. Catch us later. Thanks for listening.